Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. Mother of divine grace, pray for us. In the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Today I'm going to talk about the nine levels of prayer, and as I mentioned before, this is usually one of the areas where people get the most depressed because they realize they're not really advancing in the spiritual life. And there is a direct correlation, which I believe I mentioned last time in the last class, there is a direct correlation between where you are at in your spiritual life and where you're at in these nine levels of prayer. And corresponding to these nine levels of prayer is also corresponds to the degree of your virtue and vice. The more virtue you have, the higher you start ascending these levels of prayer. Um, and so what usually happens is people have to go through a purgative process in order to start really ascending, and most people don't even begin that process, which is usually the problem. Most people never advance in prayer because it's difficult, arduous. They suffer from distractions, which is very often uh, they get desperate because they just don't feel like they're going anywhere. Uh, they get no consolation out of it, which is, should not be the principle of judgment of whether it's a good thing or not. It doesn't matter how you feel. The issue is, is whether you're rendering to God injustice what you owe to him. St. Thomas says, I think, well, St. Augustine says that if you do not pray, you will not be saved. And St. Thomas says, essentially what that means is, is that prayer is a sub-virtue to justice. Well, actually, it's a sub-virtue to religion, which is a sub-virtue to justice. And so you have an obligation to pray a certain amount every single day in order to fulfill the obligations to God. For laymen, that usually means about 15 minutes a day minimum. If you go to Mass and you say a rosary, you've fulfilled your obligations. Um, or if you just say a rosary for the course of the day, you've fulfilled your obligations in justice. It doesn't mean you've, you've completed what you should do in relationship to charity, because charity demands that... The person seeks perfection. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, as our Lord said. And so that means that as a person, if he has an ardent love for God, he will begin the process of ascending towards perfection. And that means he's got to pray. Some people say things like, my, my work is my prayer, but that's just an excuse not to pray. Sometimes you get men who will say, you know, oh, prayer, that's for women. It's the exact opposite. Part of being a man is to engage what is arduous and difficult. That's part of, it's part of fortitude, and it's part of um, the virtue that's most proper to men. Women, the virtue most proper to them is temperance. So the, even though we should all have virtu uh, fortitude and temperance, but the point being is, is that prayer being arduous is actually manly. Some of the most manly people I know are, in fact, those who pray the most. So, nevertheless, prayer constitutes the stairs by which we ascend to the heights of heaven. And the three stages of the interior life constitute these levels of prayer. Okay, prayer is defined as lifting of the mind and heart to God. Now, by mind and heart, we principally mean the will. So what this means is the person is actually turning towards God and praying towards him, or praying to a saint, who will then, um, which is a way of... Um, getting things from God ultimately, but it's a way of lifting your mind and heart to God. And there are different grades of prayers or different levels, which are quite important. The first level, which of course is the lowest, is one, the first two levels, all men can perform. All people can do these first two levels, which is why you'll see in the old right, there is, these two levels are integrated into the right. Um, in the new mass, it's principally the first level. There are bits and pieces of the second, whereas in, this, in the old mass, there is, uh, for the lay people, it's principally a matter of the second level. And that's, I think, it's something that's important. But anyway, the first level is called vocal prayer. Vocal prayer, we mean, uh, by that we mean any form of prayer which is expressed in words, whether written or spoken. And there's two kinds of vocal prayer. There is private and public. A, an example of a public vocal prayer is the Mass, or um, when you go to a benediction, that's a vocal prayer, gen, a public prayer, generally speaking. It is a common misconception that public vocal prayer is higher by nature than any kind of private prayer. This is actually a heresy. 
It is meant to undermine people advance in mental prayer. And that is, to, it is evil because it seeks to stop people at the lowest level. And what it does is they tend to want to ignore the upper levels and just focus people just on public prayer. So it's, it's a serious problem, as we'll see why later the forms ultimately, the goal is the beatific vision, which we talked about last week a little bit, that that's the actual goal. Now, the beatific vision consists in God taking himself and pressing it on our intellect. And in that process, we see him face to face. And then St. Thomas says there's this concomitant love that naturally flows from that. So the person, once he sees God intellectually, he cannot help but love him. Okay, that is the two constituents of prayer, the mind and the heart, that is the will. So that prayer is actually the process by which we ascend to becoming most like the beatific vision. In other words, it's prayer is an approximation of what it's like to be in the beatific vision. And the closer you get to the higher, the higher you go in the levels, the more it starts taking on certain characteristics of the beatific vision. There is another corollary to this. The beatific vision means happy. You're not going to be happy unless you're praying. A lot of people, even traditionalists, will go through life trying to lead the, the, um, do what the church tells them to do, but they're constantly neglecting their prayer life, constantly. And then they wonder why they're miserable. Well, it's not rocket science. If this is the ultimate object of happiness, God, well, if you don't turn to him, if you don't look at him, you're just not going to be happy. That's just the nature of the beast. Okay. Public vocal prayer of its very nature is the lowest form of prayer because it is the least approximated to the beatific vision, which meets the perfect definition of prayer. Prayer is according to a hierarchy based upon its proximity or likeness to the beatific vision. Since the beatific vision is someone, something interior to the individual and not exterior, this means that private vocal prayer is higher in the order of prayer than public vocal prayer, which is extrinsic to the individual. However, public prayer can be accidentally higher insofar as there is some aspect which is not essential to it, giving it some greater dignity or efficacy. So, for example, the public prayer which the priest says when he's saying Mass is more efficacious than the private prayer someone's going to have in his pew, or even the public, private prayer of, those, of the priest himself. But that's because of the fact that in the public prayer, the church adds to the efficacy, because it's the actual action of the church, because the priest is the public minister of the church, the church adds to it an efficacy which he can't gain on his own. But this efficacy is different from the form of prayer. It's a different, the form of public prayer is actually not as high as private. It's not as high as private, but it can be accidentally more efficacious because of there's something else added to it. It also, just because it's the lowest, doesn't mean it's bad. Because you'll also get people who don't want to do any kind of vocal prayer whatsoever. They don't want to pray in common with anybody at all at any time. And that's also a problem. That's usually a sign their appetites are disordered. Vocal prayer is also the lowest form of prayer because it involves the lower faculties in man than does mental prayer. This will become clear as we go along. But basically, vocal prayer, you have to use your mouth and or some other external faculty. Whereas you start ascending the levels of prayer, the lower faculties begin to quiet down and cease their function so that the higher parts of the soul can begin doing their, uh, their function. Even though it is the lowest, uh, as I mentioned, it, can, it is still a good form of prayer. There are two requirements for good vocal prayer, and that is devotion and attention. Recently, I was reading a thing by some exorcists who made the observation that when they're praying um, over somebody and they're exercising somebody, how efficacious their prayer is. The demons who actually respond to this directly is based upon how much attention he actually has. So the more focused he is on it, the more brutal it is for them. But this is a sign to us that the attention that we give to the thing determines how efficacious ultimately it is. And so we should try and be as, pay as much close attention and try not to give in to distraction. And the devotion just means that we do it because we love God and we want to be close to him. The next one is mental prayer, sometimes called meditation. Sometimes they'll call this contemplation, but I don't like that particular use of the term because that's usually something that's reserved for things that are a little higher.
This prayer consists in the lifting of the mind and heart to God, but it involves the imagination. It is, there is no vocalization that occurs. It's just something that's done purely mentally. Now, there can be a thing called sub-vocalization, and that's when a person imagines the words in their own mind. Um, and that can, that can be part of it. Usually, most people, when they read, sub-vocalize mentally when they're reading something. Which, um, if, you're, if you have a really powerful imagination, sub-vocalization will slow you down. Or if you get to something that's really difficult, the sub-vocalization will be helpful. But if the person is uh, much more intelligent, if they can drop the sub-vocalization from their reading, they can actually read much faster and actually retain the material. But that depends on how much IQ power you have. But when you're praying, the sub-vocalization can sometimes help you become more focused. Sometimes it can be get in the way. So you have to be kind of careful with that. Discursive meditation can be defined as a reasoned application of the mind to some supernatural truth in order to penetrate its meaning. Okay, so what you're doing is you take some supernatural truth like Christ's perfections and you, you consider them to try and understand them. And then to love it, that is to love the supernatural truth, Christ's perfections, and carry it into practice with the assistance of grace. So you see Christ is perfect in his, he said, learn from me for I'm meek and humble of heart. He, he was the perfect man, and so we should be following, making him our example. That would be an example of it. Or it can just mean like God's omnipotence. And you can reflect, you can reflect on God, his omnipotence, and how there are different times in your life when something just wasn't going to be accomplished, and all of a sudden, boom, it just kind of happened because of the actual grace. Um, that God can bestow on people. Essentially, this form of prayer consists in the possible intellect, that's our intellect, and the will, moving the imagination and concentrating on the truth contained in the image, and it goes from image to image. And on this layer, level of prayer, it's essentially discursive, which means it's running. So you're looking at one thing from a variety of different points of view. So like, for instance, Teresa of Avila knelt down and started praying the Our Father. She spent two hours just on Our Father. She could look at it from a variety of different points of view. Or you consider a variety of different things. So, um, for example, I tell people if you want to know some of the perfections in Christ or want to understand Christ, just do the Litany of the Sacred Heart or the, his um, holy name or things like that. That'll give you some indication of the perfections that he has. And those are the different things you can look at from different points of view in your meditation. There are a variety of different methods of mental prayer. So, for instance, there's the Franciscan, the Ignatian, there's a variety of different, I'm not going to go into all those. Those are something which you can kind of take a look at on your own. Since this form of prayer depends heavily on the imagination, then, then anything that affects the imagination will detract from this prayer. This is why quiet, both exterior and interior, are necessary. Exterior quiet is, you've got to get away from everything. Now, there's some people who are so advanced in prayer, they can just kneel down, you know, and it doesn't matter how much noise is around them, they can just stay focused. That's usually a sign that they have a high degree of the habit of prayer. Prayer is a virtue. It's a good habit. It takes time to develop, and it takes a lot of time to develop. And most people don't develop it. In fact, usually they've developed a variety of different habits that go against the actual prayer. For instance, watching TV a lot gets the imagination into the habit of submitting itself to an external thing. So what happens? When you try and focus it internally, it's not used to being subordinated to reason and will. It's used to being subordinated to something feeding it images. So what does it do? As soon as it gets into this, its inclination is to want to go outside of itself. So you're constantly distracted. This is one of the reasons why I tell people if you want to advance in prayer, shut the TV off. I'm not saying it's evil. Quite the contrary, it's a good thing, it just has to be used moderately. But you have to give the external distractions, and you also have to have internal quiet. Now, internal quiet means that none of the other faculties are making a racket, and usually that means your appetite, so if you're angry at somebody, kneeling down and praying, if you've really got good habits, you can overcome the anger that way, but most of the time, all they do is sit and stew while they think they're praying, type of thing. Or, um, and it just means that appetites have to start quieting down. Now what this means is, as you start advancing in prayer, your emotional life will begin to become more subordinated to reason, it will be quietened down, because why? The emotional life does not have the same object as prayer does. Prayer has God as its object, principally, in the saints, 
and their perfections insofar as they're related to God. So that, that has nothing to do with our appetites. It doesn't have to do with food. It doesn't have to do with conjugal act. It doesn't have to do with anger. It doesn't have to do with any arduous goods or anything. And so as you pray more, just on a mechanistic level, your lower faculties will begin to be habituated and start quieting down. But not at first, because they're already in the habit of always getting what they want. So when, they, when you start praying, they're going to be constantly... Let's go watch TV. Let's go look at the computer. Mm, smell those cookies cooking over in the thing. You know, it'll be that kind of a thing. And they'll be constantly dragging you. This is why mortification, people will say, I'm really suffering distraction. Mortify yourself. You start getting those things mortified, they'll stop dragging you around. This form of prayer is hard for the mentally ill because they have very little control over their imagination. In, and also, it's also generally hard for people that don't have a lot of IQ points, although they can still do it, but it's just more difficult. Sometimes you will come across somebody who has received a grace who doesn't have a lot high IQ and that they have a high power, they have a high capacity for prayer, but that's because of the grace. To engage in this method, one must pick a specific image, teaching of the church, perfection in God or in a saint or what have you, and consider it in itself or from different points of view. This is a necessary stage. You cannot advance in the spiritual life without this form of prayer. St. Teresa of Avila makes it absolutely clear that the entrance into all of the higher levels of prayer is not vocal prayer, but it does have a place. We'll see this in a minute. It's a mental prayer. You have to meditate because it's the submitting your faculties to God, which is the process by which you start ascending this, the levels of prayer. But the vocal prayer has a place too. Through vocal prayer, consistent vocal prayer, this is why in monasteries and convents they say vocal prayers at specific times. Through a regimen, the faculties, this regimen builds up in the faculties habits of being subordinated to reason at specific times. And so it's easier for the person to actually meditate if they are a consistent person in their vocal prayer. And that's usually why I tell people, try and find a specific time of the day where you're doing it every single day, and you'll find it'll be much easier to advance in prayer. This has collapsed, in my own estimation, due to the new mass, the new liturgies. Not because it's bad, but because of the fact that it tends to stress the vocal prayer. And so what happens is, because there's not much mental prayer in it, whereas in the old masters, the, the whole canon, everybody's praying through the whole canon, or even more of it if, they're, if it's a low mass. But the mental prayer is more developed, which is, makes it easier for people to come in and pray and then when they, before they leave pray. Whereas if it's always vocal prayer, once that stops, it's hard for people to begin the meditation right away afterwards to do their thanksgiving. This is also due to a lot of catechesis and people yakking inside the church. This is one of the reasons why I gave the homily on modesty, because it's necessary for people to be quiet in the church if we're going to pray. Mental prayer's efficacy is based upon whether, in Latin we call it, the quo modo is right. What that means is, it's not just that you pray, it's how you pray will determine how efficacious it is. This is something that's very important. I mentioned this in um, the CCD class I taught last Saturday, that if you, uh, two Saturdays ago, it's not just that you pray, it's how you pray. If you, if you pray to God in the wrong way, you're going to end up offending him. There's other, the other thing is, too, is God is like us. He likes to be approached in certain ways. If, if, if someone comes to us and they're very humble or they're contrite or they're serious and they're paying close attention to us, we're more likely to give them what they want and pay attention to them. God's the same way. Well, that's what we need with respect to our mental prayer. We have to, the principal aspect to that is also, in order to advance in mental prayer, is devotion and attention as well. So we have to pay paying attention to what we're doing and not just, you know, all of a sudden start thinking about our laundry list and then the next thing you know you're thinking about your cat needs shaved and the dog is needs fed. You know, I'm serious. That's the way things tend to go. So people have to, it's the way in which you pray. This is one of the reasons why I tell people how do you know how to pray mentally? By building a solid vocal prayer based upon the traditional forms of prayer. This is what a number of the theologians are noting, is that a lot of people aren't getting anywhere in their spiritual life because they're not following the traditional forms of prayer, which would actually teach people how to approach God. So that's one of the ways in which you can do it. The third level, so these are ones which everybody can do. The third level is called effective prayer. 
Effective, this, this is a type of prayer in which the operations of the will predominate over the discursion of the intellect. There's not a specific difference between effective prayer and mental prayer. It's both the lifting of the mind and heart to God and thinking of a variety of different things from different points of view. The difference is, is that in mental prayer, the intellect predominates. It's an intellectual exercise almost in a certain sense more than it is a willing exercise, even though the will has to be part of it. Whereas in effective prayer, the will is very predominant. And one of the signs that people know they've reached this level of prayer is they get these burning desires to pray, and as soon as they pray, they kneel down, and this, their will can just immediately move their imagination to consideration of something. Effective prayer is what normally comes out of a rightly or ordered mental prayer. So if you don't pray right here, you'll never get to here. So this is one of the reasons why mental prayer is so important. How you do it will determine whether you're going to get up to the effective prayer or not. While the will predominates out of love and a desire for the good, nevertheless it still needs the intellect since the will is a blind faculty. In other words, you can't just will for the sake. You can't just will. You need to actually have something intellectually you're willing, and so you need the intellect. This serves. This prayer serves to deepen the union between God and the soul by acts of love. In other words, the person finds that they're just the the acts of love and adoring um, our Lord just flow very easily when they're in this state. The dangers at this level are that they, it can never be forced, but must grow naturally out of mental prayer. So you can't just immediately kneel down and start doing effective prayer. Usually you have to start meditating and then it, it enters right into the effective prayer. It fills the hearts with sensible consolation, and so one may erroneously judge himself more advanced than he is, or allow the consolation to become the object of his affections. I've seen that in people. People, they get a little bit of sense, you know, sensible consolations are basically spiritual cookies. We're basically like dogs. Because, you know, you, with dogs, first thing you do is you get, you know, you, you tell them, okay, roll over. And then you kind of physically roll them over, and then you give them the treat. And then you keep doing that until finally you can just show the treat, and all of a sudden, whoo, he just rolls over, right? <laughs> and then eventually, you just say, roll over, and he just does it without the treat. That's what God does with people. He gives you consolations at first. People have this idea that consolation is a sign of perfection. uh uh-uh. It's a sign you haven't reached perfection yet. The sensible consolations God gives to you because you're not advanced enough doesn't mean they're bad. They're good. Just don't let them become the focus of your attention. Your job, as St. John of the Cross says, is to, to take hold of them and make use of them to unite yourself more perfectly with God. So they're a means, not an end. Once one tastes the consolations, sometimes sloth can arise as one does not want to do mental prayer, but to go directly to the consolations of effective prayer. St. Teresa of Avila has always taught that mental prayer is required at times to return to lower levels of prayer, even after having experienced mystical contemplation. This level of prayer produces detachment, because as a person starts loving God, he starts adhering to God and become attached to God, and it starts driving out his other other affections. Increased purity of intention, in other words, his, um, he pur- it purifies his intentions and his, his motivations in life. Why is he doing this? When a person reaches this level, he starts doing things more for the love of God rather than from his own selfish reasons. It increases self-denial, and it increases charity and faithfulness and exactness and fulfillment of the duties of one's state in life. There's a converse to that. If you don't fulfill your duties in your state in life, you'll never reach this level. This level of prayer is not the terminus of the prayer life. A lot of people get to this and they think, I've, I've finally come of perfection. It doesn't work that way. It's not, that's not it. And the way you know is, at this stage, you're still committing venial sin. And that's how you know you haven't reached perfection. Although, usually when people start having effective prayer rather regularly, they'll find that the venial sins begins to really wane. The next is called the prayer of simplicity. This is a simple loving gaze upon some divine object, whether it is God himself or one of his perfections on Christ or in one of his mysteries or some Christian truth. In this prayer, the faculties become focused on a single object. So what happens is the discursion stops. Now, what people will experience in this level of prayer is usually it's at the latter stages of effective prayer they start getting some inkling of this um, prayer of simplicity. And usually what will happen is, is they'll kneel down and all of a sudden they'll start concentrating on something and it just stops. And they're just looking at some object from a particular, some divine thing from a particular point of view and it just remains fixed there. 
the experience people usually have when they come out of this, if they don't understand what it is, is fear. They're afraid of what happened. What happened? Um, for instance, they'll kneel down, they'll start praying, and 15, 20 minutes later, they look up at the clock and they're like, how is it 20 minutes later? I just kneeled down. So there's a kind of fixedness of it. And this is something, and so people will say, I must be doing something wrong. That's not the case at all. In this prayer, the faculties become focused on a single object. This prayer is necessary to bridge the gap from these four levels, which we can accomplish on our own through the aid of simple grace or, or uh, ordinary grace and mystical contemplation, which is the action of God. So this is a dividing line. And we'll see what the, why it's a dividing line. This is everything that you can do on your own. You can achieve all of this through the normal, um, through normal grace or through ordinary grace. This level of prayer cannot be reached without mortification and detachment. So people might get bits and pieces of this in prayer of simplicity. But they're, they, you start wondering, okay, they're not receiving it regularly. That means there's some attachment or there's some unmortified appetite. We've got to figure out what that is and root it out. That's why I mentioned last time it's finding out what your predominant defects is and starting to get rid of it. And that's why you've got to get rid of it if you're going to start ascending these levels of prayer. This level of prayer marks the higher limit of the active purgation. That is, it is only reached after engaging the lower levels of prayer and having done everything to dispose the soul towards the action of God, which leads to the next level of prayer. Okay, so what this is, the active purgation. And what this means is, you have done absolutely everything you can on your own to root out all of your imperfections, all your vices, and as soon as you reach the top of this, you have, practically speaking, stopped venally sinning. That's usually what happens when people reach this stage. That's why I said, when people say, you know, no sinning is at the top, no. It's here, it's the process, you get the first thing you gotta start doing if you're gonna ascend this up. It's not the last thing, it's the first thing you have to stop doing. Okay, then there is contemplative prayer, which is number five. Contemplative prayer is infused or supernatural contemplation. It's an experimental or experiential knowledge of God, an experience of God's presence, which constitutes an invasion of the soul by the supernatural. It is impossible to produce the mystical experience on one's own effort, and the contemplation is more passive than active. This comes with a caveat. Very often what people will do is they'll experience some con some consolation and they'll think, I've entered into mystical contemplation. No, you haven't. <laughs> you know, uh, this is some, or I had an experience of God, so it was a mystical, no, sorry. Sensible consolations are not quite the same thing as this. This is an invasion of the faculties. Through the intellect and will, the person starts experiencing something um, where God just takes over and the person is pretty much just going along for the ride. And so there is a, there's, it's, a, it's an interior vision of a certain sort where there are certain things that are seen or known or experienced. Infused prayer is not something gratuitous given to some individuals, but a grade of prayer made possible by the operations of the gifts of the Holy Ghost given to all souls with sanctifying grace who have reached this level. So people think mystical contemplation, well, that's just for the saints, the select few. Uh -uh. It's for everybody who reaches the top of the prayer of simplicity. Once you reach this simplicity, prayer of simplicity, then what happens is, is God, once you've reached this, God lifts you over into this higher level. Now, what this ultimately means is, is this. You have to do everything you can to root out all the imperfections and everything that you can and achieve this highest level on your own. And as you start doing that, the, your emotional life and your appetites will begin to become more subordinated to reason and to, they'll become virtuous. In other words, you'll start gaining virtues. You start ascending here. You, have, you don't give the prayer simplicity unless you have a certain degree of virtue. It doesn't mean you're perfect yet. You have a certain degree of virtue. And it means that your faculties are becoming more subordinated to reason. And so as that happens, once you reach the prayer of the highest levels of the prayer of simplicity, your appetites are subordinated to reason. Your faculties don't distract you as much anymore. And you become very focused. And that's a sign that you've rooted out your imperfections. 
So what this is, is it's necessary for all of the lower faculties to become united under reason so that when a person reaches that stage, God can lift the person over into mystical contemplation without the other faculties becoming a problem in the process or distracting or interrupting the process. That's why you have to mortify yourself if you're ever going to reach mystical contemplation. But let's be very clear about one thing. This mystical, mystical contemplation is not for the select few. It's what God intends for everybody. What happens in purgatory is God just guts this whole process by taking your body away from you and you instantly enter into this. And then you go through this purgative process, which is much more involved, called the passive purgation. And this is when God starts the process. And the passive purgation is brutal. Why? Because our sin, as I mentioned last time, is so deeply rooted, God has to go in and start yanking it out by the roots. And that usually means that the way he does that is through intense suffering. This is why St. Paul says, God chastises those whom he loves. This means that we must dispose ourselves by achieving the prayer of simplicity. Once we reach a certain level, then God takes over the prayer. This experiential knowledge of God is not clear and distinct, but obscure and confused. So in other words, the person, it's not real clear what's going on there. Yet it gives full security and assurance to the soul that it is under the action of God. Infused contemplation, since it cannot occur without sanctifying grace, gives the soul moral certitude that it is in the state of grace. So even though we can kind of have a general idea that we're not in the state of mortal sin because we haven't committed mortal sin since our last valid confession, nevertheless, this gives you a level of certitude that you have above and beyond that. This form of prayer admits of variations and fluctuations in that we may, it may last for a long time or for a short time. Because this level of prayer is beyond what we can produce on our own and exceeds our natural capacities, it is indescribable. In fact, John of the Cross used to, with all these higher levels of prayer, describe them by putting them in poems. And then he would explain what they mean to a certain degree. This form of prayer frequently causes reactions in the body. For example, the eyes will become clouded and dull, respiration is weak and intermittent, limbs are partially, partly paralyzed, Heat of the body decreases, especially in the extremities, but they should be ignored. This form of prayer produces a suspension or binding of the faculties, as we see in those in ecstasy. And what that means is, when they enter into this, they don't really have control over their lower faculties. Infused contemplation causes a great impulse for the practice of virtue. So one of its effects is the person has a real strong desire for virtue, because he's trying... He, he, in this motion, in this experience of God, he recognizes the need for perfection and virtue in order to attain God in the beatific vision, and so it renews him, it strengthens him, as he desires to become perfect through virtue. Those who experience this love of prayer should not cease discursive meditation until one clearly perceives the call to a higher grade of prayer, and one ought to stop the discursive prayer as soon as one feels the impulse to this infused contemplation. Effectively, this means that when God, through a grace, indicates to the soul that he wants to take over, the soul has to um, let him. He must give himself completely to the interior life, and by that we mean to the spiritual life, when he reaches the stage if he's going to start, if he's going to advance any further. It requires a level of commitment that you're not going to get at these lower levels, that the person may not have had at these lower levels. The next is called the prayer of quiet. This is an infused contemplation which principally affects the intellect, which is withdrawn from the other faculties. Hence, this is why the other faculties must be sublimated. But the prayer of quiet especially affects the will. And by sublimated, we mean they have to be subordinated to reason and to the intellect. Although the intellect and the memory are, um, are now tranquil, they still remain free to realize what is occurring. But the will is completely captivated and absorbed by God. As the name of this level of prayer indicates, it tends to com contemplative silence and repose. At this level of prayer, as opposed to infused contemplation, the other faculties remain free, and so one can engage in this form of prayer while fulfilling one's duties. So someone can and actually be in this, admit, experiencing mystical contemplation while they're cooking bread, for example. The, the lower faculties can be, continue to execute their functions while the intellect is engaging in this higher activity. St. Teresa describes the prayer of quiet in the following way. 
From this recollection, there sometimes proceeds an interior quiet and peace that are full of happiness, because the soul is in such a state that it does not seem to lack anything. And even speaking, I refer to vocal prayer and meditation, wearies it. It wishes to do nothing but love. This state must last for some time, and even from long periods of time. We begin to see why prayer quiet is necessary for prayer, not only because the lower forms need it, but as one ascends the levels of prayer, the more one desires the quietude to dominate. What this means is, as you start becoming more virtuous, and as you start ascending the levels of prayer, you want the lower faculties to be totally quiet since you're always disposed towards God and so that you can always pursue God, so that there's no, no impediment to experiencing Him or to loving Him or pursuing Him. The effects of this prayer are great liberty of spirit, a filial fear of God, which means that you have a strong desire not to offend Him, <coughs> profound confidence in God, love of mortification and suffering, deep humility, a disdain for worldly pleasures, and a growth in all of the virtues. And so what this means is, is the passive purgation is you're rooting out the virtues and you're starting the process of becoming more perfect in the virtues. And these virtues are being perfected principally not only because of the fact that you're doing your part, but also by cooperating with the purgative process which occurs during the stage. By that cooperation, the person becomes more virtuous. The passive purgation begins with these, with actually... There is some indication that the passive purgation is clear at this stage, at these stages. But there's some indication that God will start sending them at this uh, bits and pieces of it at these two stages. Teresa of Avila makes the observation, there's some people who don't pray a lot, but God will drag them through the passive purgations by severe trials and tribulations. And if they correspond to those, they can be purified. In other words, he can, he can drag you through this process in different ways. The thing is, though, is, is that as you, you start to become purified, what happens is the prayer usually starts taking over anyway, so the person starts developing a prayer life anyway, especially when they start suffering. This also begins with a call, the illuminative stage. And that the illuminative stage is when God starts communicating to the person knowledge which is not capable of being had through ordinary means of acquisition. So, for example, I think I might have mentioned this uh, recently, but Teresa of Avila makes the observation that there was a t there's times when she's in um, prayer where God will communicate. God communicated to her one time how absolutely one the three persons of the Trinity are. And so she said they were so unified, it was hard to imagine them as three separate persons. And then she says at another time, God communicated the distinctness of the persons, that there's three persons of the Trinity. She said they were so distinct, this knowledge, that it was hard to imagine them as one. So the point being is, is God can convey knowledge to the person in a different mode, and that's what actually is happening. Now, they might get bits and pieces of it at this level, but it really begins at the mystical contemplation stage and higher. It usually ends, and it is not included in the transforming union, because at that stage something specific happens, and then the person's in a constant state of knowing something, which we'll see when we get there. These purgative stages and illuminative stages and stuff will overlap a bit, and then, yeah, we'll talk about that a bit. St. Teresa says that the, in the illuminative stage, God communicates knowledge in different ways. During the purgative stage, God begins stripping us of how we think about him, not because it's wrong, but because it's inadequate. And what that means is, is that people, people will begin to experience, once they enter into the, the passive purgation especially, which is actually part, um, when they start getting into these levels of prayer, there's some indication of purification of the senses, which is really what's taking place. When they, the purification of the soul really begins, they'll enter into a state of confusion because God starts stripping them of the way that they even think about him. So they can't even remember how they used to think about God. They, couldn't, they can't even bring up any image about him. And yet they have perfect confidence in him and they're loving him, but they can't imagine him. And they say that when you go through that, when you, God strips you of the way you think, there's a certain darkness. You know, if, someone, if you've got a flashlight and you're looking around and somebody comes and takes your flashlight, well, you don't see a whole lot. Okay. Well, the problem is, 
is that when we're in these levels, we're judging our knowledge of whether things are good or bad or should be done or not, or based upon our appetites and how we feel. God starts stripping us of that, and it start, it's also based upon our images that we have of God, which we received in childhood and whatever, or wherever, and God starts stripping us of that. Because it's a necessary thing in order to prepare the intellect for mystical contemplation and for the beatific vision. By the way, as I mentioned, purgatory begins here. If you don't do all this in this life, you're going to do it in the next. But uh, go through the, pa the passive purgation in the next. You can't do anything in the act of purgative thing once you're in purgatory. It's over with. All you can do is sit there and suffer. And love God because you're happy because you're going to get to see him. Okay. But the point is, though, is that as God starts stripping, you, people go through a certain confusion. They don't know what to think and what they do. And if someone starts going through the um, dark night of the senses, they need to get a spiritual director. Because it's at that point that, you know, you're feeling around in the dark. Well, somebody with a flashlight has to be able to tell you, okay, go over here. All right. So it's an important point. This knowledge communi is communicated sometimes to the soul and not to the intellect. And what that means is, is Teresa of Avila says that there is a way in which God can communicate to us without going through our intellect, which is kind of an interesting thing. Then there is the prayer of union, and this begins the unitive stage. This is a grade of prayer of mystery in which all the interior facul internal faculties gradually captivate and occupy with God. In the prayer of quiet, only the will was captivated, and the sleep there was a sleep of the faculties, and the intellect was also captivated, although the memory and the imagination remained free. At this level of prayer, only the external senses are now free, but they too will be captivated in the next level. The characteristics of this prayer are a lack of distractions, certitude of being intimately united with God, absence of weariness and tedium, and much greater, much greater than the prior two levels. There is also, along with this level of prayer, what they call mystical touches. These are a kind of instantaneous supernatural impression that gives the soul a sensation of having been touched by God himself. This divine contact imparts to the soul an ineffable delight that defies description, and sometimes the soul utters a cry and falls into ecstasy. It also is accompanied by flights of spirit. This is strong and unexpe unexpected impulses of love of God that leave the soul with a consuming, consuming thirst for God. The soul feels that it could never satiate its thirst for love. These prior two, St. Teresa describes and St. John describes, describes as fiery darts of love, which are certain hidden touches that, like a fiery arrow, burn and pierce the soul, and leave it completely cauterized by the fire of love. Wounds of love are similar to these, but they are stronger and last longer. Here the soul begins to burn with the love of God, and it causes the soul great affliction because of the separation from God. What's happening is the person is starting, it's, God is purifying, the, it's, he's going through the past purgation, but they're starting to experience what is called the pain of loss. And what this means is, is the pain of loss is what the souls in hell experience when they, when at their final judgment, God says, well, you go here. And they know for all eternity they're going to be cut off. But it, when you go to your before, stand before God, he communicates to you your absolute need for him to be happy. And that is something which the soul fully clearly understands and sees. And so when it's put in hell, that, that pain of loss is his greatest suffering for the rest of eternity. What happens is at this level, the person starts suffering this pain of loss. That is, they're starting to experience something which the souls in purgatory do. St. John calls this the burning flame of love in which one burns from within from the sheer love of God. The next level is called the conforming union. In this level of prayer, God even captivates the external senses with the result that the soul is totally divinized, so to speak and prepared by God to move to the full and final commitment of the transforming union. External activities are difficult because they leave, the person must leave God interiorly to serve God externally. And so the person does it out of charity, but it's difficult. It leaves a longing for death so that it can, so that it can be with God, so the person is still experiencing the pain of loss at this stage. It's marked by ecstasy. Some authors call this ecstasy prayer. The soul, emer 
uh, the soul emerges in that it is in God, or the soul experiences that it is in God, and that God is in the soul. And the concentration is so complete that all of the faculties are absorbed in this union. So in other words, a person is so captivated by the thing, he's totally absorbed in it. In this form of prayer or ecstasy, it seems that the soul is no longer in the body, and the body itself has experienced a losing of natural warmth. Yet, this is accompanied by great sweetness and delight. It is not harmful to health, but often improves one's health. In its violent and painful form, the bodily suffering is so intense that the individual can hardly bear it. It seems as if the entire body has been dislocated. St. John of the Cross states that it seems as if all the bones have dried up and the body has lost all its strength. Sometimes the body becomes completely cold and appears as if dead. The sweat and delightful form of ecstasy is simply simple ecstasy, and the painful form is called transport, flight of the spirit, or rapture. Uh, not the same thing that the Protestants understand by rapture. This form of prayer is hallmarked by the fact that the person has no sensitive awareness. You can touch them, they don't even feel it, they don't see it or anything. The vital function seems almost interrupted. They almost appear dead. Uh, Padre Pio, from time to time, they noticed he would go through these. In the violent form, the body sometimes remains exhausted and painful over a period of days. In the painful form, this is the last stage of purgation, <coughs> as when one fires a kiln red hot so as to burn away all of the impurities of the metal. So this is the last stage of the, of the passive purgative level. Then the person, so this is a person reaches this. Once a person gets to the highest level, that generates the transforming union, and at that stage, the person is no longer in the purgative stage because there's no, he no longer needs to be purified of anything. God's already burned it all out of him, so to speak. This transforming union is also called mystical marriage. The soul is totally transformed into God, the beloved. Here, God and the soul give themselves to each other in the consummation of the divine love. And by that they mean that the person gives himself to God through perfect charity. That is, he does everything and sees only God in all things. So far as it is possible in this life, just as marriage is permanent, so this level of prayer is permanent. So once you reach this level of prayer, for the rest of your life you will always be in that level of prayer. There's been a number of people who have reached this level. All the apostles reached it. Our Lady obviously had it. It is believed that Our Lady was in a conforming union until she received, our, accepted Our Lord. She didn't need any purification. But the mystical marriage with her took place when she agreed to be the spouse of the Holy Ghost and carry Christ in her womb. So she enters into this mystical marriage. Between God and the soul, there are perfect communication and the mutual gift of self, from over which the reason the prayer of transforming union is called spiritual marriage. St. Teresa teaches that in this grade of prayer, unlike the grades that precede it, there is a permanency of union and love. Concomitant with the permanent union of love is the soul's confirmation in grace. St. John of the Cross maintains that the transforming union never falters, and the soul is confirmed in grace. But St. Teresa warns that as long as we are in this world, we must walk with caution, lest we offend God. However, the apparent contradiction is readily solved when we say that the confirmation in grace does not mean intrinsic impeccability. It doesn't mean that you're, by your very nature, not capable of sinning. For the Church teaches that that is impossible in this life, except with respect to Our Lady. Nor is it a question of avoiding all venial sins in this life, for that requires special privilege of grace which was bestowed on, our, on the Virgin Mary. I'm not so sure I agree with that, and not all authors agree with it. It's my contention, and other authors' contention, that God doesn't take you as his, as a spouse, so to speak, in the mystical marriage, if you're going to continue offending him. So, there is usually, in some um, hold that important fact, at this stage, the person ceases offending God by sin. That doesn't mean they don't have... I think as Teresa of Avila makes the observation that at this stage the person will have inadvertent faults. Now that doesn't mean they have imperfections because those have already been rooted out. And that doesn't mean at this stage they don't suffer anymore. Usually their suffering increases but it's no longer for purification's process it's because the soul, God uses the soul in order to, through the suffering, to merit those things necessary for other people to become holy. But the point being is, is that there's no, if, if a person doesn't need any more purification, 
then there shouldn't be any um, volitional venial sin at this stage, at least it would seem. The intrinsic peccability is something which was given, um, well, Christ had it. Our Lady had impeccability, but as a grace conferred, not something due to her nature, which was due to Christ. So that was something which is a specific, particular privilege given to Our Lady for her whole life. But once a person reaches a transforming union, you don't have intrinsic impeccability. What it is is God, through a grace, sustains you until you die. And then you have impeccability, because after that you're not going to commit any more sin. The hallmarks of this last level of prayer are forgetfulness of self, a desire to suffer, joy in persecution, a desire to serve God, a perfect detachment from everything that is created, absence of ecstasies. In this state, one is in, a, is in a constant state of mystical contemplation, and yet all the faculties are perfectly sublimated. And by that, we mean that a person who's in the transforming union can think, can, even though they're having this constant mystical contemplation, they can think, carry out their duties, they can talk, carry on normally like any other human being, um, which we saw with Our Lady and um, Christ, who had the beatific vision, was capable of doing that as well. So this is one of the hallmarks of that. There are certain people who reach this level, as I mentioned, so the apostles, probably, there were a few other people, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, St. Francis of Assisi probably reached it. St. Margaret, uh, Margaret Mary had it. She talks about how at a certain point she always had, she had a constant awareness of Christ's presence, which is a description of the transforming union. St. Teresa tells us that it uh, is left at this stage is for God, what is all that's left is for what she says, God just has to tear the veil. Oh, by the way, at this stage, they no longer suffer the pain of loss. And then at this stage, at the transforming union, they're willing to stay in this life as long as God wants them to be here. At this stage, these two stages, they long for death because they want to be with God. But at this stage, they no longer long for death, but their desire is to do God's will and remain in this life as long as he chooses them to live. But at this stage, since all the purification has occurred, all God has to do, she says, is tear the veil, and then you'll see. You'll, then you'll enter into the beatific vision. You don't. You bypass purgatory. You know, it's uh, pass, go, and collect the two hundred dollars type of thing. Because all your purification has already been done, so there's no point for you to go to purgatory. So the person, basically, by the tear the veil, she means God just has to allow the person to die, and then once that happens, they immediately enter into the. They go to the judgment, and then they go to the beatific vision. In, these, in seeing these levels of prayer, we begin to see how few people are advancing towards God. It's helpless to know something about ourselves, where we're at. Now, I said this is often very depressing, because most people realize they haven't gotten beyond mental prayer, and they've got all these levels to go through. You can't ascend these very rapidly if you have perfect fidelity to grace. Most people do not are not faithful to the graces that God sends them. You know, they might get inclinations to do certain things, but they just ignore them. And, you know, God might give the person an inclination to prayer, but instead they sit and watch TV. It's that kind of thing. So this is one of the reasons. And they don't do what is necessary to root out their imperfections. This is one of the things I've really noticed. It's usually not until people start getting into the effect of prayer that you really start seeing them get serious about their mortification, unless God gives them a specific grace. Most people just aren't serious about rooting out their defects. This is why I always tell people the three pillars of the spiritual life are spiritual reading, so that you actually know what you're doing, prayer, because you have to develop the habit of prayer so you can start ascending, and in order to keep you from being held down, you've got to get rid of your imperfections, because that's what the purgative process does. It Cleaned you out so you're ready for the transforming union. Well, most people don't do the mortification necessary. Most people are just spiritually tepid. They would just presume they it's just they just think oh it's just easier to kind of sit here and you know not do anything. Spiritual sloth is very comforting to most people, and that's why they never advance. So what's the moral of the story? You're just never going to get to these higher levels without serious mortification. And by that I mean, yeah, oh, the third pillar is you have to root out your defects. So the first thing you do is find out your predominant defect. How do you find out? Well, traditionally, you ask the Holy Ghost, which is the love of God, to communicate to you what your defects are. And then you ask your guardian angel, because he's got to deal with you day in and day out. So he has a pretty good idea of what's wrong with you. So what you do is you ask them to, you know, Please communicate to me what my predominant defect is. Now, some people, when they do that, they'll get this floodgate opened up. Uh, and then they say, okay, close it, close it, close it. Right. 
<laughs> Some people that go along, they go along, they go along, and then it just kind of slowly kind of emerges that this is what it is. But once you find out your predominant defect, then you root that out. And the predominant defect is usually some capital vice, some capital sin, or it's a, it's a sin from which other vices flow. And so if you get rid of that one, very often they'll find these other things go away. And so like if they get rid of the anger, all of a sudden they're not beating their wife anymore. Imagine that. You know, it's that kind of a thing. So there are certain things that will just simply evaporate on their own. Or if people have a problem with anger, that if they st if they start uh, one of the effects of anger over the course of time is malice, and so what they'll find is as they start rooting out the anger, they'll become more sensitive to the malice, and it'll be easier for them to will good things for people that is have to be benign rather than malicious, and so that's why you have to find out what your predominant fault is and remove it, and then you just start going down the line. Okay, I got rid of that one. That was nice. All those went away, but now I got this one. And usually what happens is the person will start getting rid of the stuff that's obvious. But the motions of the interior life are often very secret, even to the very individual himself. His motivations are not even hidden even to himself. And so what will happen is, this is why again you have to pray again to the guardian angel and to the Holy Ghost to keep revealing these things to you. And then over the course of time, they'll start cluing you in about, you know, you never really dealt with this, or here's the hidden motivation behind all of this. And that's what will end up happening. And then that, you, you do your mortification, you do your prayer consistently, lead a normal Catholic life, and you'll ascend to the transforming union. Otherwise, you're just not going to get there. Okay. I'm having an easier time dealing with volume two at this point. Oh, well, I thought you were up here, Jim. Right here. <laughs> not quite. Maybe, maybe next time. Um, can you talk, you mentioned sensible constellations, but can you talk a yeah. little bit more about what those are? What sensible yeah. constellations are is there are there's something communicated in the imagination and the appetites of the individual which give him a sensible or physical pleasure or joy in the contemplation. And so usually what will happen is that somebody will they'll be thinking about some perfection in Christ and then they'll receive some type of consolation in that. Or they'll be, you know, they'll be going through a rough time and they'll pray to Our Lady, you know, who is the solace of consolation and they'll ask for, for consolation and they'll receive this kind of this consolation. It's kind of a physical thing. That's sensible consolation, but then there's also other kinds of consolations, spiritual consolations, which are more intellectual and volitional. So, for instance, you know, sometimes a sensible consolation will occur when somebody sees some aspect of the faith they hadn't seen before. And so there's a certain, there's a certain intellectual joy or, a, or a, even a volitional joy in complaining. They might not get much repetitive movements. They might get some emotional side to it too, but it's usually something that's in the intellect and will, and so there's a, um, a joy that occurs there. Again, these are given to a person, but what happens is there's a certain stage where they're stripped from the person because it's a necessary thing because... What God does is, is he, as you start ascending the prayers, he gives these to you in the beginning to get you moving. You know, you're just sitting there, so he throws these bones every so often. But then what happens is he takes them from you because he has to, pur he has to purify your will. He doesn't want you doing the things in the spiritual life because you're getting the spiritual cookie. He wants you doing it because you love him alone. This is why John of the Cross was very clear in stating that even you can't even become attached to the sensible or spiritual consolations because if you do, they'll get between you and God. They are only a means to the end. If you become attached to them, then people will do the things to try and get that spiritual consolation out of it or the sensible consolation out of it. And then what you're doing is you're setting up that thing as your God and not God. So this is why you have to be detached even from those. But they are, God gives them to you at certain stages in order to spur you along. Even when you go through certain levels of contemplation and through, um, pure, uh, through the passive purification, it's, it's very oppressive almost. The person is just suffering tremendously through this. But certain times, God knows people's limits. So what he'll do is at a certain stage, he'll lighten up and the person will see certain kind of consolations and a certain liberty of spirit, and then he'll bring them back into it. Because it takes time for God to purify us of this, and the more wicked we are, the longer it takes, the more it takes to root it out. God can cure a lot of things just through simple grace, but uh, normally he prefers to do all of this slowly with most people. That's why it's so important to, to get the get the grace that, be faithful to the grace that God sends you. Yes. And when you pray for the souls of purgatory, do you give them spiritual boost of some kind? Um, what you do, it, it, actually what can happen is they talk about how in purgatory, when they're at the lower levels, you know, it's just like burning in hell. The only difference is, you know, you're going to heaven. 
But then there's different levels, and there's some where there's specific sufferings that go through, but then there's a higher level where the soul just has to wait it out, and that's because God's purifying them through the pain of loss. They've kind of reached this stage. What can happen is, is that if you get um, like a, a partial indulgence or you pray for the soul in purgatory, what can happen is, is that you can fulfill the requirements that God, instead of dragging them through, God will accelerate them through the process, so they may end up just hoping to have to go to that third level and kind of wait a bit until they get into heaven. So there seems to be some indication of that by what some of the souls have told us when they've um, come back to tell saints. If they don't receive that, they still receive the consolation of the fact that it's communicated to them by God that, the, that their sentence has been shortened by, the, by your prayers. So when they get to heaven, at, even at that stage, they're very grateful, but when they get to heaven, they'll pray for you because of the fact that you have gotten these things for them. Or, and in some cases, actually lightened their burden in purgatory. I've seen some cases of, there's actually a few cases of these where souls actually appear to ordinary people. Exorcists talk about sometimes, I didn't see the particular woman that appeared, but there was a house that I had to exercise and then um, I said a mass for the repose of the soul because I thought this met the criteria, which exorcist says that if, if it's a demon, they'll be doing things and causing you trouble. Whereas if it's just a soul in purgatory, because what happens is, is if somebody commits a sin in a particular location, sometimes God will lock the person sitting there. And you just sit there until some requirement is met, such as the thing over which they committed the evil was destroyed or the restitution was made in their name and then they're freed so the soul will stay there. And so there's been occasions where people, the souls have actually appeared. For example, there was a, this, this particular case, the woman was appearing, and the way you know it's one of those souls, they just kind of stare, stare out into space. And it's probably a sign that they're going through this, they're experiencing this, and that's God's way of communicating that to us. After I did that, she stopped appearing. There was a case of Canon Doyle, the case of Canon Doyle, I don't know if anybody heard of that case. When he died, he, they turned his house into a museum, but he started appearing in his house. I don't mean to get into this preternatural stuff, but this just gives you an idea of what we can actually do for them. They, he appeared, and everyone freaked out, of course. And so then they said, well, let's get a priest in. So he appears, and the priest says, well, let's ask him what he wants. So then what he did is he left, led the priest over to his desk, and in his desk there was a trap door, and in that trap door was a piece of paper where he had repudiated all of his error. He had died a Catholic. But before, God would not release him from purgatory until that was posted. So as soon as it was posted... He stopped appearing. So what that is a sign of is, is that God expects us to help them out, to get it to get out of purgatory. But that's usually a sign they're in these upper stages as far as God is, you know, there's no grave sins or things that they've really had to work through or that type of be purged of, and so God will let them go through this process. Sometimes, too, God will allow them to appear, even though they're in the lower levels of purgatory, in order to communicate something to us. So like in Italy, there is a place where one of the souls in the lower levels of purgatory appeared, placed his hand on a cloth and had left a searing image. And there's another place where they left his hand on a on the door, or on a, I think it's on a doorstop, and it left the image of a hand on the doorstop. So these are this is a signs. God will allow us these signs in order to bring us along so that we'll actually pray for them. But uh, anyway, yeah. But once you reach the upper levels, uh, you kind of stay there, or I guess if you get no. spiritual swap, you can drop all yes. the way back down to one or two. Until, at any one of these stages, you can fall back down in the lower stages. Naturally, Father, or that would be a bad thing? Uh, yeah. I didn't know if it was, you know, allowed you to kind of go in and out. No, it just means, well, usually when people are in the, even when they're in the conforming union, they still have to be doing mental prayer, and then God will bring them into, the, into this kind of level of prayer. So, but that's why Teresa Bell says it's the entrance to all the higher levels. But you, once you get into the transforming union, you can, in fact, meditate on these things, but you still have this per, perpetual vision that's going on, basically. Does Satan try to, you know, get you more? Is he trying yeah, to there's different things he tries. Usually what happens is, as a person starts ascending, there's different things he tries, you know, the first thing he tries to do is get them hooked on the consolations. Or then he'll try and get them hooked on spiritual pride, like how far you're getting, you know, um, things like that. And so that's how they end up very often falling, is through pride or something of that sort. Yeah. If you experience a dark night in the soul, is that the devil sometimes tries to really throw you off? God will allow the devil to afflict you through different sufferings in order to purify you. 
But God allows it not just to purify you, he also does it because he wants to humiliate Satan, because he knows you'll rebuff him. He also does it to, to manifest his glory, um, to, purify, to purify you, to, to perfect you. There's a variety of different reasons he does it, but yeah. So Father, if he allows that, does that have any relationship at all to us saying, uh, pray that you should not be put to the test? Yeah, because you hope you're not so to. So we're praying that, that if we're, if we're close to that level, that we're not allowed to be tempted by the devil. Is that correct? Yeah, you can be tempted all the way up. When you reach the transforming union, there is some indication that the saint will come and bug you still, but it's not the same kind of a thing. You know, there's that great line from Teresa. I always tell people when it comes to demons, you ignore them to the greatest amount that you can. So, like, for instance, the, there's that line when Teresa of Avila was sleeping. I think it was Teresa was, I can't remember which one it was, but she's sleeping. And Satan appears over her. And she wakes up, she looks at him, and she says, oh, you again. She just rolls over. <laughs> and that's the attitude you have to have towards them, because they don't get anything if you ignore them. So, yes. Um, in the middle prayer, um, is it only meditation? Yes. It's only, what if you're not able to meditate? Oh, well, actually, everybody can meditate. It's just that some people can't do it as well as others. So very often people start to sit down and meditate, and they'll find they just can't stay focused or something like that. And that's just a sign they have to just keep at it. As I mentioned, prayer is a habit. Well, it's like any other habit. In order to develop it, you have to do it a lot of times, and then it becomes a habit. So they'll find when they're first starting out, it's just very difficult to do. If you want to know a really good book that explains all of the mechanics, as well as the do's and the don'ts, it's a very, very dry book. But it'll explain everything you need to know. It's called The Ways of Mental Prayer by a guy named Lahodi. It's put out by Tan. But anyway, this is the book that you want to get. It'll explain how to do it. Um, because that's usually the real problem, is people just don't know how to do it. So, the, ways of mental prayer. the Ways of Mental Prayer is the book. Christos vincit, Christos renta, Christos impera. Christos vincit.